Welcome to ACCA's presentation of the NATE certification for service technicians. This is a uh, service core exam review. It is the first of three parts. I am your presenter, Jack Rise. Very briefly, I was a contractor for 18 years in wholesale distribution of HVAC products for 13 years and worked for a major manufacturer for five years. So, as I always say, I've been on both sides of the counter. I have a pretty good idea. Uh, I have NATE certifications myself. I think, don't even know how many, four, six, not sure. But I've taken the exams, I proctor the exams, I run these review classes all the time. And uh, my guys in my classes do very well. They, they, they score very highly on the exam. So uh, uh, hopefully this will be of some uh, good use to you as well. Let's go forward. Our purpose is to give you the information necessary so that you can successfully complete the NATE Service Corps exam. This is a progressive series. It is important that you understand part one before going on to part two and so on and so forth. We suggest strongly that you have a pocket calculator. You're going to need it. There's going to be on any given exam, there's probably going to be anywhere from four to six questions that are going to require you to have a pocket calculator. And the kind of answers you're going to need are going to be two and uh, sometimes even three-digit example uh, decimal points, so you're going to need a calculator. This is not something you're going to be able to do by hand. And the calculator you need to bring to class is not your cell phone or your laptop, because those will not be allowed in the exam room. User assumes all liabilities. The user of the information contained herein assumes all liabilities relative to its application. Please understand that what we're trying to do here is give you information that helps you get through an exam. We're not trying to beat you up or anything else, and we're not trying to be smarter or less talk up or talk down. We're just trying to give you the information. We're trying to help you, but we can't be responsible. We physic no one could be responsible for someone else's interpretation of what's said. So our advice is always the same. If you're in doubt, get more information. Be careful how you apply things. There's plenty of information out there. Don't stop your education with these CDs. The more you learn this is an industry, the more you know, the further you're going to go. No question about it. Let's talk about the exam because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, getting you through that exam. An exam consists of 150 questions, but it's two exams. The first exam is the core, and it's a separate exam. It's in a sealed envelope. This is a proctored, monitored exam, all right? And it has 50 questions. Then you're going to pick a specialty, heat pump, gas heating, air conditioning, whatever specialty you're going to uh, qualify in. That has 100 questions. But until you pass the core, your specialty doesn't have any value as a certification. You won't be NATE certified till you pass a 100-question exam for a specialty and a 50-question exam for a core. So the, the passing rate for both of those exams is 70%, not collectively. Each one is 70%. Now, that sounds like a cakewalk. Out of 100 questions, you can get 30 wrong and still pass. Out of 50 questions, you can get 15 wrong and still pass. Sounds like a cakewalk. Don't bet the ranch on it. This is academic. I'm sure you're, if you're at this level and you're taking this exam, you're probably a, a, a well-qualified or at least fairly qualified service technician. It doesn't mean you can answer questions on a test well, because this is academic. If I spent a week in the field with you, I'd be able to give you an A, B, C, D rating, and you with me, I'm sure. But we don't have that option here. Uh, that w the, light <laughs> the world isn't constructed that way, so the way we show our metal or our proficiency is through an exam. Now, if you're going to give an exam, it has to be academic by nature. 
What do you call the gauge on the left side of your gauge manifold, for example? Is, you know, you call it the low side gauge. So do I. So does everyone. Well, it's actually a compound gauge. It's compound because it does two things. It reads pressure above and below atmospheric pressure, pounds per square inches and inches of mercury. But you're probably not used to referring to it as a compound gauge. It's a very academic clarification or identification of that device. This is the way you have to think. If I said to you, what color is a copper wire? And here are the options. And the only options, and there's only one correct answer. A, it's red. B, it is yellow. C, it's blue. Or D, none of the above. The answer is D, none of the above. The wire isn't red. The insulation is. The wire is probably copper or aluminum colored. And that's the way you have to think if you're going to answer academic questions about what you do. You have, to, you have to think differently about the questions you're going to be looking at on this, on this exam. Uh, what did Wayne Dwyer say? If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Now that I have you <laughs> confused, let's go forward. So you need, to, you need a 70% passing rate. You have a maximum, maximum of four hours to complete the exam. So you can take easily within a 150 questions, you should be able to answer in four hours. You can also take the core and then take a couple specialties, providing you have arranged that with the provider of your exams. How many ever uh, specialties you can fit into a four-hour period you can take and become qualified for, because you only have to take and pass the core one time and then you take all the specialty exams you want within the specified time period. Now, I think it's five years. Your, your, your certification expires in five years, so once you've passed the core, you can just keep adding specialties within that five-year period. You have a maximum of four hours. Okay, now, don't start an exam you can't finish within that time period because at the end of four hours, the proctor will pick up the exams whether you're done or not, and it won't matter. If you don't answer a question because you didn't have time to finish it or you've skipped it or whatever, it'll be counted wrong. So don't start something you can't finish. And if you see two correct answers on the exam and you want to be a wise guy or a sharpshooter and you know answer both C and B are correct, whatever the case, then that will be counted wrong also. Uh, there is only one correct answer to each question. So you have to decide what is the best answer in either case, even if you do see two correct answers. And that will happen from time to time on any exam. Bring a pocket calculator to the exam. Again, your cell phone doesn't count. You won't be allowed to have that on. You won't be allowed to have communication with the outside world. So you're your laptop's not going to be on. You need a handheld calculator. Bring it to class. You'll be allowed to have that, a number two lead pencil, and whatever the proctor gives you in the form of exam materials. That's the only thing that will be allowed on your desk. Successful completion can earn multiple certifications. For example, if you take the core exam and you pass it, and you take the heat pump exam, the heat pump service exam, and you pass that, then you will have four certifications. You will be given heat pump service, heat pump installation, air conditioning service, and air conditioning installation. That one exam gives you four certifications. Anytime you pass a service certification exam, you automatically get the installation certification for that same specialty, whether it's gas, heat, air conditioning, whatever. In the case of heat pump, you get not only the heat pump, but the air conditioning as well, because as you well know, heat pump is an air conditioning process. If you have taken an exam in the past, then you were given a NATE ID number. If you passed anything in the past, you took three exams and passed one, you, you were given an eight ID number. You must bring that to class because the only way they're going to know who you are is relative to that number, not your name and street address. That's 
become meaningless information in this world of computers. Now you need that particular number. It's very important. By the way, if, if you take a core exam and let's say a heat pump exam and you fail the heat pump part, you pass the core, you have two years to retest to pass just the heat pump part that you failed. Let's say you take the gas exam, gas heating service exam, and the service core, and you pass the gas exam, but you fail the core. Again, you have two years to retake just that core exam, the 50 questions, and then if you do within that two-year period and you pass it, you will have your certification as a gas service technician. You know, that, that applies across the board to all the exams. But if you pass a service exam, you will get the installation uh, certification as well. It does not work the other way. If you pass the, uh, uh, let's say, heat pump core for installation and the heat pump installation exam, that's all. The only certification you get is heat pump installation. You don't get service. Let's go forward with this. Uh, and this is, uh, there's no order to this. That's why I didn't name the parts or the CDs don't have, you know, air conditioning or heat pump or airflow or anything like that because it's, uh, uh, the core says that this is core information that everyone should know that's, you know, calling themselves a service technician in our industry. So uh, I can, they can ask you about anything here. They can ask you about air conditioning, heating, uh, hot water, steam, they can ask you anything they want. It's core information, general information that 80% of the people should have 80% of the knowledge of. Fresh air. Why do we need fresh air in a building? Well, houses tend to depressurize. And uh, they tend to do that because there's a lot of drivers involved with that. The negative, and it can, and when I say depressurize, that will create a negative pressure in the house. And that can, again, there's a lot of drivers for that. The HVAC system uh, is one of them. The duct system primarily, if it's attached to a chimney because it's less than 90% efficient, then that chimney alone having a chimney stack effect will create a negative pressure. Kitchen exhaust fan, uh, fans. Clothes dryer, uh, central vacuum system, not a vacuum cleaner, but a central vacuum system will, you know, that takes air out of the house. And if air leaves the house, it has to be replaced. And when that happens, you create a negative pressure in the building. The duct system. If you have a perfectly sealed duct system, it's tight, it's airtight, or as close to airtight as you can get then the amount of air you supply to the building will equal the amount of air you return from the building because it's uh, just a blower there in the middle. All right, This thing is not a magic wand of any kind. There's no little men that work in there. Uh, if you're bringing back 1,000 cubic feet of air every 60 seconds, then you're going to supply 1,000 cubic feet of air every 60 seconds because the point of greatest negative pressure in the house is right there at the entrance to the air handler or blower. And the point of greatest positive pressure is right on the other side of it. And the device in the middle, the mechanical devices in the middle, the blower, is going to create that balance. It must equalize. Negative must equal positive. That's the, you know, the first law of Mother Nature. Now, in a scenario like this, let's say you had a real tight return duct and you had a leaky supply duct. The result of that will be you're going to supply, actually return more air than you're supplying. The result of that is this blower now will create a lower pressure within the building that will force air from the outside, which is at a higher pressure because of the blower creating a lower pressure inside. And, you know, more goes to less. Uh, Mother Nature Always make sure of that. If you have the other scenario where your return is loose and leaking and your supply is tight, now you're going to pressurize the building because you're drawing air into the return from an unconditioned space. Could be a crawl space, could be an attic, whatever, but it's an unconditioned space that's not part of the conditioned space. You, you're going to supply more air than you're returning, and you'll pressurize the building. 
as a result of that. And I'm not talking about you're going to have a 20-pound pressure difference between indoor and outdoor. I'm talking inches of water column, 0 0.03, 0 0.01 inches, those kind of very small numbers, but they increase or decrease or neutralize pressure. The good thing about pressurizing a building is that you reduce infiltration. The bad thing is you still got to heat and cool the air that you're bringing into the building because it's coming from an unconditioned space. So to pressurize a building to reduce infiltration doesn't save any money. <laughs> it doesn't change anything. It's still costing you money to heat and cool air that may or may not be necessary. One way of overcoming this is you can bring the air in from the outside directly into the return side of the heating and cooling system. That will help to, that'll, if you have a negative pressure in the building, this will help to create a more neutral pressure. That's what we're going after here. We don't want, we don't want a, a, a positive pressure in the building. That is going to cause a lot of uh, infiltration from the unconditioned areas, and we don't want a negative pressure in the building. That's going to cause infiltration directly from the outside. We're, we're looking for neutral here, or as close to neutral as we can get. I don't want to be unrealistic about this. What is combustion? Let's talk about that. Now, I know we're dancing all over the place. We were just talking about the uh, air being brought into a building, either uh, negative pressure, positive pressure, and now we're talking about combustion. But that's the way the exam's going to go, too, guys. You're going to have a question just like that on infiltration, and the next question is going to be about what are the elements of combustion. And then the next question is going to be uh, what's a 55-degree uh, superheat tell you? You know, you're going to be bouncing all over the place. This is the way the exam is done, and properly so. It's, it's a good exam. Not perfect. Nothing is, with the exception of myself, but we, it, it, is, it is a good system. Anyway, what is combustion? Well, first of all, combustion needs three things to happen. If you want a conflagration, if you want a fire conflagration, then you're going to need three things. You're going to need some, some form of fuel, wood, paper, gas, I don't know, whatever it is. You're going to need oxygen, and you're going to have to have a heat source to start to get these two things going. Once you have this going, the result is heat and light. Now, this combustion, this, this combusting of materials is a chemical reaction. It's a chemical process. In fact, this particular process where you burn wood is actually called, it, it sublimates because it skips a step. That is to say, all things exist in one of three states, solid, liquid, or vapor. So when we take a solid wood, and we go right to vapor, the gases that are, that are burning, all right, that become the flame, then we skip the liquid step. I don't know anybody that deals with liquid wood. Uh, it doesn't exist in this environment. So that, that's a sublimation of, of the process. But nonetheless, that process creates, it's a chemical reaction that creates light and heat. And it's done by combining a fuel with an oxygen and then either supplying a spark or some kind of heat that's above the combustibility range of, it, of that combination. Let's talk about bypass humidifiers. In particular, bypass humidifiers. Because, why am I talking about Because I'm teaching the test and, and they're going to ask you about bypass humidifiers on the exam. And, and also because it's probably the single most common application of, hu of residential humidification is the bypass humidifier. And they call it a bypass because what it does, it bypasses some of the supply air to the return. All right, remember, this is right here is the point of greatest negative pressure in the entire system. This is high positive pressure. So when the air comes out of here, forget temperature, doesn't matter. When the air comes out of here at the bonnet, it's under pretty high pressure in this whole area. However, this whole area, and the closer you get to this point, the greater that negative pressure is, is under negative pressure. So the supply air, in the case of heating, is now hot. That hot air is pulled in by this negative pressure in the return. 
it goes over this wet pad or um, drum or whatever you have here. I'm just showing a pad here because it's simpler to draw. That hot air goes over that damp pad and absorbs the moisture. doesn't put any water droplets, at least hopefully it doesn't, into the airstream, but it does put damp air in the airstream. Now that damp air mixes with the return air, all right, and heads back to the uh, furnace, and hopefully most of it goes out to the building, and about 15% of it is bypassed again, and, you know, re it's heated, and uh, hot air can hold a whole lot more moisture than cold air can. We'll look at a psychrometric chart in a little bit, and maybe you'll get a better appreciation for that, but cold air is always, almost always, dry air in most climates that you live in. One thing you want to remember is, and one thing they're probably going to ask you in a test is, what position is this damper in? During the heating season, it should be fully open, and during the summer, it should be fully closed. You don't want to bypass cold air over a wet coil. Hopefully, you're, you know, shutting the water off, taking that uh, wet pad out, and, you know, in the summertime. But if you're not, uh, at least close off that bypass damper. All right. We're trying to eliminate, in most environments, we're trying to eliminate moisture in the summer, not create it. Of course, if you live in Tucson, Arizona, then that might be a good thing to run in the summertime. might help the actual comfort in the house being so low on relative humidity. Sling psychrometer that we all know and love. Uh, I'm not a big fan, only because it's never properly applied. And I don't think it's a necessarily a very accurate instrument because of that. There's just too many things that we do wrong when we're using this thing. There's nothing wrong with it. It's an accurate tool. It's just that I think there's better technology out there today in the form of digital. One thing I do want you to, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, uh, one thing I do want you to understand is uh, uh, what we call wet bulb depression. And that's the difference between the uh, uh, wet bulb and the dry bulb. And the greater that difference, the drier the air is. The more difference there is between wet bulb and dry bulb, the more dry the air is. For instance, when wet bulb and dry bulb are the same, when there's no difference in temperature, when they're both, make up a number, 96 degrees wet bulb, 96 degree dry bulb, it's raining. It's 100% relative humidity. Or it's you're in a fog or something like that. It's awful damp. And as the difference between wet bulb and dry bulb continues to broaden, the air gets drier and drier and drier. Understand this whole process, all right? This is a, a sling psychrometer. is an instrument used to measure the amount of moisture in the air is a sling psychrometer. This instrument consists of two liquid and glass thermometers. One thermometer measures air temperature in form of dry bulb, while the other measures wet bulb temperature. Now, understand this. These two thermometers on this device are exactly the same. They're both dry bulb thermometers. The only difference is one of them, see the wick is rolled up in here, one of them, in this case the one on the right, has a, a, that wick extends down over the, the bulb of the thermometer the bulb being the place where the mercury or alcohol or whatever is in that thermometer is held. Go through the program with me here. Uh, after the wick is dipped in, and here's the key word, distilled water, and that's one of the reasons why I don't like this device. I challenge anybody who's listening to this tape to tell me they have distilled water in their truck that they use to dip this wick in. Be careful. <laughs> where you dip that wick, because if you put it in regular tap water, and the tap water is not severely softened to the point where there's no minerals in it, and that's going to be exceedingly rare, then the minerals in the water, when you whirl this thing around and the water evaporates, where do the minerals go? They stay behind, and they cling to that wick, that cloth, and now that becomes harder, if you will, and the moisture in that wick can't get to the bulb. And if the moisture and the bulb are not in direct contact with each other, then you, you don't have the pro you can't get the proper wet bulb reading, because as you whirl this thing around, what's going to happen is that's going to speed up the evaporation process. Anytime something evaporates, vaporizes, boils, it takes heat away. 
So it's going to, as it you whirl it around, it's going to evaporate at a higher rate because of the wind speed, and it's going to take heat out of that bulb and drop the wet bulb temperature below the dry bulb temperature. Because you can't change the air temperature by moving it. I know any time air moves over your body, it feels cooler. But that's, that's what we call wind chill. It only feels different. It's zero degrees outside, and the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour. It feels like 20 below, but it's only zero degrees. Only zero degrees. It's cold in either case, but it's not 20 below. It just feels like it because the, any exposed skin, is gonna, any moisture on it is going to evaporate at a rate that's going to make you feel cooler. After the wick is dipped in distilled water, oh, and let's talk about the wick. Uh, you always wash your hands, of course, before you touch that wick so that it's not brown or, in the case of most of them, I see almost pitch black with oil and grease, which also prevents that water from getting to the bulb. It's just it's very difficult to use this device in the field. Get electronics. This, this is the 21st century, guys. All right, this is 1940s technology. It was good. It's still good, but it takes a little care in using that our world now just doesn't allow for. Come on, get to the point, find a problem, fix it, get to the next job. You know, uh, you can't make money if you can't do that. And to use this properly is going to slow you down. The sling psychometer is whirled around. Uh, uh, when do you stop doing it? I know, when your hand gets tired or 4 o'clock comes. Or when, when do you stop whirling this thing? 300 turns, 30 turns? When the wet bulb temperature stops dropping, that's when you stop. And there's no time period involved with that. That's the other thing we don't do when we use this device. Water evaporates from the wick on the wet bulb thermometer and cools the thermometer due to the latent heat of vaporization. All right? Anything that vaporizes, evaporates, boils, causes heat to be removed from whatever it's attached to. The wet bulb thermometer is cooled to the lowest value possible in a few minutes, hopefully. This value is known as the wet bulb temperature. Then you put the two opposite each other. It has a, a nifty little scale here. When you fold them back up, you put the uh, wet bulb opposite the dry bulb, and it reads out the relative humidity directly. The drier the air the more the thermometer cools, and hence the lower the wet bulb temperature. you got to understand everything on this page. And wherever in this program I've made bold italic stuff, that stuff is almost verbatim on the exam. They're going to ask you a question about this, about that, and about this specifically. They're going to say to you, how is a wet bulb thermometer made? What does it consist of? Well, let's see. You should know by this point it's a dry bulb thermometer or, or a regular thermometer, however you want to look at that, the same thing. It's covered, its bulb is covered with a wick that's wet. All right, those are the three things. It's going to be a wet wick covered by a, uh, um, uh, uh, covering the bulb of a thermometer. And it has to be whirled around in the air. To, uh, it doesn't have to be. It can sit there. But it's going to take a whole lot longer for that wet bulb temperature to drop to the point where it stops dropping and you have an accurate reading. All right? So look at this from different angles if you're preparing this for, the, uh, for this exam. All right? Now, let's take a look at the psychrometric chart that's relevant to this psychrometer, the sling psychrometer. If we're in a room and the room is 70 degrees, and I know 70 is over here, but there's the mark. And it's wintertime, well, the, uh, a properly humidified room is going to be 30% relative humidity. And that's going to be rare that you see that in a residence. But 70 degrees at 30% relative humidity, that air holds 35 grains of moisture. Every pound of air holds 35 grains of moisture. Now, just to qualify, there's 7,000 grains in a pound of water. So... We're, it, it's uh, and a pound of water is about a pint. There's what 8.33 pounds in a gallon. There's eight pints in a gallon, so a pint is about 
you know, a little, little more than, than uh, one pound of water. So if we, and there's 7,000 grains in a pound, so if we have 35 grains, that's 35 very, very tiny visible, but very tiny drops of water in every pound of air. A pound of air is 13.33 cubic feet. A phone booth has about two pounds of air in it, so about half the air in a phone booth. We got 35 little tiny droplets for proper humidity. Proper being the humidity that makes us feel comfortable. Not too dry, not too damp. All right. When it's 70, we want about 30% relative humidity. Most people. Okay. So that's great. Now, you turn on the heat, and uh, heat coming out of the registers is 90 degrees and very often above. So if you were going to maintain that same 30% relative humidity, you would now have to uh, have 60 grains of moisture for the same pound of air. And, uh, yeah, I know, the, 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 it's still a pound of air, even though the volume changed. It, it was warmed up 20 degrees. The difference is 25 grains. Where's that going to come from? Well, hopefully, when you sold this furnace with an outlet temperature of that, knowing you started with this, you gave me a humidifier with it. I can't imagine anyone in the northeast or the, any part of the country that's not in a desert or at elevation like Salt Lake City or places like that that wouldn't sell that. Because if there's nothing to make up that difference, that 25 grains, what you get is this. You're back down to your 90-degree temperature, and you're left with this same amount of moisture, even when it was properly humidified, that means that the relative humidity <laughs> in that house is now down to actually below the relative humidity in the Mojave Desert. Okay? Uh, if you vi visited the Mojave Desert recently, it ain't real damp there. So I... I I don't get selling furnaces, you know, in normal four-season climates without humidifiers. I just don't get it. You're, you're just, you know, you're going to get all the complaints, dryness. You know, every time you turn the light switch on, you get a spark. You know, every time you walk across the carpet and scuff your feet, you can light up a, the lamp without turning the switch on. You know, you, it gets pretty bad. I know it is where I live, two places. I, I live in New Jersey uh, uh, part of the year, and I live in Florida part of the year. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's not fun in the wintertime. Florida, of course, is different. You know, it's damp there pretty, not all the year round, but we don't get the high... Uh, the low temperatures that require high indoor heat. Our outdoor temperature in the wintertime is ASHRAE rates it at 50 degrees. That's our, most of the time we're 50 degrees and warmer. Uh, where I live in New Jersey, it can get down to zero. Uh, you know, that, that's cold. And, of course, the heat's blasting, and the hotter this temperature, the more grains of moisture you need. So this is, this is what our industry is based on right here, especially in the heating season. So that, that's all wet bulb and all that jazz. That's nice. Now, dry bulb temperature is commonly used by non-technician people, non-technical people, uh, when they're discussing human comfort. When you say to people, go any customer you have, say, uh, when are you guys comfortable in here? Oh, you know, in the wintertime, we like to keep the thermostat about uh, 70. You know, in the summertime, we bring it up to 74, 75. They'll tell you about dry bulb temperature all the time. And dry bulb is, you know, can be read on any thermometer. That's dry bulb. The, the temperature scale here, the thermometer here is dry bulb. Uh, this is dry bulb. The, the, this is what people refer to because they don't understand wet bulb. They don't understand. They know relative humidity. The higher it is, the damper the, it is outside and all that jazz, but they don't understand what the proper relative humidity should be in the wintertime you know, 30% and in the summertime, 50% inside. So they, they don't, they're not technical. Don't expect them to be. That's your job. They're going to talk to you relative to dry bulb temperature. Inside design conditions. Inside design conditions. By that we mean what, what are the conditions you want to maintain inside in order to be comfortable? Well, human comfort, and this is a piece of that psychrometric chart we were just looking at, Human comfort depends on a couple of things. Three things, actually. Dry bulb temperature, 
you know, the thing people go, oh, my thermostat says it's 70 in here, and, you know, it feels colder than that. You know, well, it might if the relative humidity is not proper. Relative humidity, dry bulb, and relative humidity, you can say wet bulb temperature, but that's not how you read uh, relative humidity. That's only one aspect of it, okay? And, of course, air velocity. Now, we're all sitting here, hopefully, at 98.6 degree core temperature in the core of your body. But just blow on the back of your hand, and you'll get a little chill, a little tiny chill. I don't care what the temperature in the room is. You're going to feel a little tiny chill. That's because you've increased the velocity of that 98.6 degree air that was coming out of your lungs as it went across your probably 82, 85 degree skin temperature. So even though the actual air temperature, 98.6, was warmer by a good 10 degrees or so than your surface temperature, even though it was warmer, it actually felt colder because of the higher velocity. That's wind chill. That's what velocity does. If you want cold air complaints, put a heat pump in somebody's house. Blow 90 degree, 90 degree air on them at a high velocity, something above 600 feet a minute, 500 feet a minute, and they're going to they're going to scream bloody murder about cold air coming out of the outlet, and you're going to show up with a thermometer and it's going to say 90 degrees. It's the velocity that's that's causing the complaint, not the temperature of the air. Air velocities within the occupied space, from the floor to six feet above, and two feet off the walls, the occupied space should fall between 25 to 50 feet per minute, never more than that, all right? Um, 25 to 50 feet per minute is considered terminal velocity. It's so slow, they actually call it terminal. By the way, 65 feet a minute will blow a piece of paper off your desk. That's, that's the relative velocity, all right? Construction. Well, if you're going to start chopping somebody's house up to run ducts or refrigeration piping or uh, wiring or whatever the case is, then you should understand how a building is built. All right? Now, there's a couple things on an aid exam they paid particular attention to for a good reason. And, again, the only reason I can say that is with confidence is because for, God, since Nate's been around, since Ace and Nate got together, I've been monitoring and proctoring the exams and giving preparation classes and uh, to prepare the guys to take the exams, and I consistently see the same questions all the time, although there are different versions of the exam. So uh, I can say with uh, confidence that there's a couple things you want to pay attention to here. Understand that a stud is a uh, vertical member. A joist, whether in the ceiling or the floor, is a horizontal structural member that rafters are always on an angle. You're not going to see a, a wall rafter. There is no such thing. Um, know that the stud, for instance, is attached at the top to a top plate and at the bottom to a sole plate. Now, here I'm showing a double top plate. It's not uncommon to see a double sole plate where you have two two by fours or two by sixes, whatever your, your width is here, uh, on top of each other. Sill, girder, you know, the girder, again, is, is uh, this is what they call a pier and beam. We're going to give you a little better explanation of that. Um, girders support the primary weight of the building. What else are they going to Oh, uh, sheathing. Sheathing is the weather side of the rafter. Okay, unless this is a finished area, on the inside, even though this is, in a, let's say, an unconditioned attic, it's not going to be finished off here. The next finish is going to be in the ceiling, gypsum, sheetrock, whatever the case is. All right? Fascia, facer, however, tomato, tomato, uh, soffit, okay? Um, trying to think of what else they're going to point out in particular. Do know that uh, studs are 16 inches on center in most building codes, not all of them, but most building codes uh, require 16 inch on center for residential R1 construction. That puts 14 inches between the bays, inside to inside, okay? But there's 16 inches center to center. And architects, watch that when you're looking at a, uh, a drawing. 
if you're looking, most architects will use center line dimensions. In other words, when they say this room is 10 by 10, they mean from the center line of the stud to the center line of the next stud, it's 10 feet, not the inside dimension. The inside dimension in that case is going to be less by close to 4 inches. All right, so it depends on how detailed you want to be. But do understand the structural components. Do understand this distance between studs. All right? This is what they like to call pier and beam foundation. This is used uh, almost exclusively in uh, crawl space application. It, even though this looks similar to a column or something like that you might find in a basement, you're not going to generally see this kind of structure in a basement. Uh, they're going to use columns uh, only because they take up less room. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just that it, you know, it gets a little more cumbersome uh, to develop in a basement. You put this in. The masons work here, standing up straight, long before these girders and rafters and all that go in place. Uh, rafters, uh, joists. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's switch gears again. I want to talk to you uh, for a minute about a magna helix because. Uh, this comes up uh, in, in a lot of forms, uh, I believe, on the exam. Um, first of all, understand what a magna helix is. Understand that it reads a pressure. It, it can read one of two pressures, and they're both the same. All right? I know that's confusing. It either reads differential pressure. That is to say you have two probes connected to this device. There's a, a high, what they call a high port here and a low port here. And there's also another pair in the back, and you have to plug off the pair you're not going to use because you can only have, you know, one side working at a time. So if I read a, a low pressure here and a, a, a lower pressure here, this is on, I'm assuming this is a return, then that's a differential pressure and this gauge will deflect, the needle will deflect to read that difference in pressure from here to here to show me what the pressure drop is across this device. That's called the differential pressure. If I take one of these probes out and leave the other probe in, it doesn't matter which one, now I'm reading a pressure relative to atmosphere. But that's differential too because what I'm doing is I'm comparing atmospheric pressure to the pressure in this duct. Maybe this will help. The device we use uh, when we're using, or the one you should be using when you're using a magnahelic or an incline manometer, is uh, what they call a static pressure tip. And they call it that because of this. If you'll notice the way in the last slide, the way these tips were arranged, they were arranged in the direction they point in the direction of airflow. And the reason they do that, right at this tip, you can see it's shaped like an arrow. And the reason for that is it deflects the air away from this rod area here. And there's no hole right in the tip of that to sense the air pressure. The holes are right in the side here. There's two on this side and two on the other side. And this is just an empty tube. That's all it is. And your manometer, magnahelic, whatever, connects right there. The hose does, all right? And it reads that pressure in the tube. So th this acts like an airplane wing. When the air velocity enters here, it pushes that airstream away and creates a dead zone where this, <laughs> this can read then only the static, the bursting pressure, the pressure that's present everywhere in that duct system. It doesn't read velocity pressure because the velocity is forced away. So, and get the one with the magnetic base. That way you can just put it in the duct and it'll stay there. Or even fiberglass duct it'll stay connected. You don't have to keep holding it up with your hand. Now, the reason I'm pointing, and this is the one thing I want to get to, this is truly a diaphragm type differential pressure gauge. If you look at the cross section view, you can see a diaphragm runs top and bottom. And that one probe is connected to one side of that diaphragm, and the other probe is connected to the other side of the diaphragm. And what's connected to the needle? The diaphragm. 
so that when you have a pressure on this side that's greater than the pressure on that side, it forces the needle this way, and when it's the opposite, it forces the needle the other way. So all pressures with a differential type gauge that you're reading are always relative to atmosphere. So when you put two probes in to the same device, you're just reading a differential pressure. Magnahelix readings are differential or relative to atmospheric pressure. And when a relative to atmospheric pressure is like this, where you only have one probe in place. Now, this side, let's say, of the diaphragm, this side is reading the high positive pressure from the blower, and this side is reading atmosphere, which is going to be less than the pressure in the uh, in the duct system because that's at a higher pressure. And what's that going to do? That's going to force the needle to the right. And over here, we connect the low side reading and the, the high side gauge is connected to the atmosphere. It's not connected to anything. The result is this is going to have a much lower pressure and that's going to force the needle in the opposite direction. As static pressure increases, amp draw decreases. No doubt about it. In fact, we're going to talk about this in a little detail, I believe, in another section where we get involved with PSC motors and PSC motor facts and that kind of thing. But suffice it to say now, as the static pressure increases, the amp draw on a PSC motor, not a, not a variable speed motor, a permanent split capacitor motor, the standard common motor we encounter every day in blowers, is going to decrease. Take a look at this system. Is there anything wrong here? We got 0.35 inches of static pressure right there. And right here we put this magnahelic in and we're reading 0 0.60. Anything strike you as being a problem? Well, this could be a very, you know, there's a lot of questions you want to ask right here. This is kind of generic, but... That seems okay to me. It would, of course, depend on how wet this coil was and what the pressure drop across the coil was. Because at any point I put that probe in, I read from that point forward in the supply side. So if I took this probe out and I had it above the coil and the pressure drop on an average, and this, you know, put this in quotes, big quotes, average typical A coil, it dries about 0 0.2, 0 0.25 wet is about 0.35, all right, 0.3 depending on the coil. So to say C35 under here is perfectly acceptable. If I had that probe out and I put it here and it couldn't see this pressure drop, it was only reading the static pressure in the supply duct system, then 35 would be very high. So the question is, where's the probe? All right. When someone says, you know, 3.5, is that a uh, high supply static? Well, where did you put the probe, under the coil or over the coil? The same thing here. If I put the probe here, I'm going to see the resistance of this, the pressure drop of this uh, uh, air cleaner here. If I took it out and put it here, it couldn't see that. It, it can only see backwards. This can only see forward. All right. That's the simplest way to think of this. Now, when I'm looking at 6.0, that's high. Now, it could be that the coil's dirty. This uh, media filter here is dirty. All right, if I take it out and retake the test and I still have that number, then I got a problem. All right, I have uh, well, what I, I would consider unacceptably high return static pressure because the total pressure that this blower is looking at is this pressure plus this pressure. I know this is negative. This is going to show up on a digital manometer as a minus 60, all right, minus 0.6. And this is going to show up as a positive 3.5. But you ignore the signs. You add them up. The total pressure that this blo external static pressure that this particular blower is looking at is 6.0 plus 3.5. That's 0.95 inches of static pressure. That's almost a full inch of static pressure. That's a high static pressure. Blowers, all just about all blowers that you'll encounter in residential and light commercial work are rated at half inch. And we've almost doubled that static pressure that that blower has to overcome. So if this was a three-ton blower, uh, not anymore. 
it's not delivering 1,200 cubic feet. It can't, not against 0.95 inches. The only time that blower can deliver 1,200 cubic feet of air is when it's working against half an inch of external static pressure on high speed. Let's jump to evacuation. Why not? This is a test. This is the way it works. You see this device here underneath that big don't use this thing? That's a compound gauge. Compound because it measures pressures above atmosphere and below atmosphere. Pounds per square inch above atmosphere and inches of mercury below atmosphere. This, is, this device is what you call one size fits all. The compound gauge should never be used to determine what the vacuum, actual vacuum pressure, evacuation pressure in a system is. All right, it goes from zero to 30 inches of water column. A perfect vacuum is 29.92 inches of mercury. We, we are not interested in inches of, where did this come from? Why are we using it? Well, if you work on low pressure centrifugal chillers, you want to know that your low side barrels in a vacuum. And that, this is a great way of finding that out. But, and if you're uh, pumping down a compressor in the field and you're a serviceman, residential serviceman, and you choke off the supply side, you know, close the liquid line valve and start pumping the system down because you have to make a repair. Maybe you're going to replace the evaporator. Pump the system down. When you get around zero or so, or, you know, you never, never want to run a compressor in a vacuum, but when you get close down here, shut the pump off. And you're still going to have a little expansion and all that, but at least this gauge can tell you when you're getting close to creating a vacuum. That's all it's for. Those are the end of its uses for you in the field as a service contractor. Everybody, a lot of guys use it to try to determine uh, when the system is properly evacuated. When I get to 30 inches, I know I'm done. Uh, how long has the pump been running? Well, we don't, we don't necessarily use the compound gauge, the low side gauge. What we do is let it run through lunch. That way it gets a good 45 minutes or an hour of evacuation. You can't evacuate a system on time. If you had a small leak and you were using this as a device, you wouldn't know if you had a leak. You've heard it. I know you've heard it. If you've been in the business long enough to properly evacuate a system, you need a 500 micron evacuation. You see the, the width of this needle? All right. The, at the smallest point, the width of that needle is 3,000 microns wide. How the heck are you going to know when you're at 500 microns? You can't know it. Get a, get a micron gauge. That's the only way you're going to know when you have the proper evacuation. And if you had a leak, a small leak in the system, and you continued evacuating through lunch or whatever, all you would be doing would be pulling in moist air into the system and further contaminating it. The whole idea behind evacuation is to degas, to uh, lower the pressure in the system so that any moisture in the system will boil off, become a vapor, and the pump can pull it out. All right, because the, the pressure outside is greater than the pressure inside. So if we're at sea level or wherever you are in the world, if you happen to be at sea level, then if you go straight up 120 miles, that is the end of our atmosphere. You know, you got the, uh, what is it, the troposphere, then the stratosphere, then the mesosphere, then the thermal sphere. You got all these spheres, right? Right here is where roughly outer space begins, 120 miles up. Well, that 120 mile column of air certainly has a weight. And if you were at sea level, you would realize that its weight is 14.696 pounds. We round it off to 14.7 pounds per square inch. Atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere of this 120 pounds of air standing on top of us at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute. It works this way. I have a house near the beach in New Jersey and we're dead at sea level. And if I were to walk with you out on the beach and we were to both stand right at mean low tide with our ankles in the water. Can't get any more sea level than that, man. 
and I were to hand you a gauge, not a manifold set, just a simple, this gauge right here, a compound gauge, and it wasn't connected to anything, and I gave it to you, and this needle wasn't on dead zero, what would you do? You'd stick a screwdriver in here and start adjusting it till it was at zero. Well, what you did when you did that was you completely ignored 14.7 pounds of air pressure that was working on this gauge. You, you, you took it right out. So this is, as a result, what we call any reading you have in this gauge is going to be pounds per square inch gauge pressure. If you had adjusted this to read 14.7 pounds with not connected anything, it would have been an absolute pressure gauge, PSIA. I know I'm cutting corners here, but you get the point. What I want you to remember is, is this, that 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute includes the weight of that column of air. And if you're at sea level, that pressure is equal to zero on your gauge, zero gauge pressure. Now, here's what's going to happen on a test. They're going to give you a gauge reading and say convert it to absolute, or they're going to give you an absolute reading and say convert it to gauge pressure. So if they give you a gauge reading, let's say they say, uh, 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 I'm making up a number, 50 pounds gauge pressure is equal to what absolute pressure? Well, 50 plus 14.7 is 64.7. So 50 pounds gauge pressure is equal to 54.7 PSIA, pounds per square inch absolute, because absolute includes absolutely everything, including the weight of the pressure of the atmosphere. Now, why is that important? Well, when you're doing efficiency concerns uh, with compressors, compression ratios, that kind of thing, and you're, it's fine when all your pressures are above atmosphere, like low side pressure, high side pressure on a vapor compression system, you're okay. But when you get into centrifugal chillers, and your low side's in negative, below atmospheric pressure, in inches of mercury, and the above atmospheric pressure is pounds per square inch, you can't do the ratio. It doesn't work. They're two different values. What you do is convert both pressures to atmosphere and then do the division, do the ratio. This is where this comes from. This is for guys that work in those machines or you that uh, I'm assuming you're a residential light commercial contractor and you don't get into chillers that, you know, this only warns you when you're getting into the danger zone. It's not to be used for evacuation. Now, we just said that a perfect vacuum is 29.92 inches of mercury because that weight of a column of mercury, 29.92 inches high, is equal to 14.696 pounds. So if I put a, we have a teeter-totter here, and I put a 14.7 pound weight there, and I take a, a, an empty tube here and start pouring liquid mercury into it, when the mercury gets to a height of almost 30 inches, that teeter-totter is going to be dead level because they're, they're equal. That, that's what 29.92 inches of mercury is, is 14.7 pounds per square inch, absolute PSIA. Now, let's flood out of there into some mathematics. What the heck? You know, this is an exam. This is the way it's going to go, potpourri. Three is what percent of five? Why, why might you want to know this in our industry? Well, when you're doing proportions, you got to, you know, uh, they, they tell you to put so many parts of this in with so many parts of that. I understand what they're asking you here. They say three is what percent of five? Well, three is three-fifths. Anytime somebody says to you, X is what percent of Y, Y becomes the pi. And in this case, the pi has five parts. So when they say 3 is what percent of 5, you say, oh, okay, then 5 is the whole. Then what I'll do is take this piece of pie, 12-inch piece of pie, you know, 12-inch round, and I'll divide it into five equal parts. Oh, and you want to know what 3 of that is. Well, I'll take 3 parts out, and when I take 3 parts out, I'm left with 2 in the pie pan. 
And what I've taken out is three-fifths of the pie. And it doesn't matter what these numbers are. When they say blank is what percent of what, of, of what, then what becomes the whole, and blank is the part of it. You make this a fraction. When they say 3 is what percent of 5, you say, oh, okay, that's 3 fifths, 3 over 5. And what do you do with something like that? It's a fraction. You divide 5 into 3, and what do you get? 0. 0.6 if you have a calculator. And if you multiply that by 100, you'll get, you'll convert this decimal to a percentage. So you get a choice here. You divide 5 into 3 and you get 0.666666 on your calculator. You can just hit multiply 100 equals and you'll get 60. If you have a percentage key on your calculator, you can hit 3 divided by 5 equals and you'll get this and then you just hit the percent key and it'll spit out 60 percent. So you do it either way. But it's always by 100 because we're trying to find out what percent this is. That's the way you deal with all ratios, all fractions. Remember, fractions are ratios, ratios are percentages. Another thing they're going to ask you, the three angles of a triangle, this happens to be a right triangle, always add up to what? They always add up to 180 degrees. This is a 30-60 triangle, so this is obviously 90 degrees, this is 30 degrees, this angle is 60, 90 and 30 is 120, and 60 is 180. Why do you need to know this to pass this exam? This may have a whole lot to do with laying out ductwork. I, I don't know what the purpose of the, exam, of the question was. I can only tell you that it shows up very often. The three angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. So if you know these two angles, you can know that one. Because if you have these two, you can add them up and subtract it from 180. It will give you this one. What's 60 and 30? That's 90. Subtract 90 from 180 because, you know, it always adds up to 180. 90 from 180 is 90. You'll know that angle. All right? You don't have to put it on a graph. You can do it in your head. This is triangulation. That's how far... That's how we figure out how far away things are, in the, like the night sky, the moon. If I'm in New York and I set my telescope up to look at the moon, and I call you in, I don't know, France, and you're in Paris, and you set your telescope up and at exactly the same time, and we note the angle that our telescopes are facing, and we know this distance here, because we know the distance from New York to Paris on a map, and you're at 60 degrees and I'm at 90 degrees, all we got to do is add them up and subtract from 180. We know that the moon is at a 30 degree angle from you and at a 90 degree angle from me. And now, if we have this distance, we can calculate the hypotenuse of the, of the triangle and know how far away that moon is from France and how far away it is from New York. Thank you for your time and attention. I know how difficult it is to find time to do things like this, but unfortunately in the world we live in now and in the industry we operate in, um, exams like this are going to become more and more common. That's life in the big city, huh? All right, let's do some Q&A, a little question and answer period here. Number one, relevant to what we just asked now, these are not questions that are going to be on the exam. Of course, that would be a little too easy, but these are questions that are about what we just discussed because all the areas we just discussed will be on the exam. So what I'm trying to do is get questions that cause you to think again about what it is we just spoke about. Why would you want to introduce fresh air into an occupied residential structure? Why would you bring outside air into a residence? Well, why would you open a window to allow that to happen? To create a negative pressure within the building? To create a positive pressure within the building? To create a neutral pressure within the building? All the above. Why would you want to do this? Well, you know, typically, typically, Best answer here, we're trying to create a neutral pressure. We, we have a, a pressure that's unacceptable. We have, a let's say, a negative pressure, and we're trying to get that back up or as close to neutral as possible. 
Because if we have neutral, we, we don't have any significant infiltration. And we're not losing heat because of pressurization. You know, losing heat, losing cooling. All right? um, and by the way, if you don't think that infiltration is important, let me tell you very strongly to take a course in Manual J, and you will realize the full 8th edition, the unabridged or abridged, whatever you want to do. We offer CDs on that, by the way, right through Acker's Bookstore, the uh, understanding that's part of the uh, HVAC Essential Series, Understanding Manual J. And it explains in nauseating detail exactly what it costs in terms of BTUs to bring that um, amount of air from the outside in a residential structure. And let me tell you right now, you're talking in the tens of thousands of BTUs. And it will cause you very often to change the size of the equipment, to go up a size or whatever because of that infiltration if you calculate it properly. Uh, the same with air conditioning. It can be close to half a ton. Uh, and I'm talking about a 95-75 you know, uh, design temperature area where it's, there's a 20 degree temperature difference and moisture involved with that kind of thing. You can be very close to half a ton of air conditioning. Air conditioners are typically sized in half ton increments. Furnaces are typically sized in 20,000 BTU increments. So when you have 10,000 more because of your infiltration, that might cause you to go into the next size. So take a look at it. Investigate it. Again, don't stop here. This isn't enough. Question two, a ducted distribution system that is not in the condition space and is well sealed on the supply side but has numerous leaks on the return side can create what? A negative pressure within the condition space? A positive pressure in the condition space? A neutral pressure within the condition space? None of the above. What's going to happen? you got a ducted distribution system, a duct system. It's not in condition space, so it's in an unconditioned space, attic, basement, crawl space, whatever, that's not conditioned. It's got a well-sealed supply and has numerous leaks in the return. What's going to happen to the building? Definitely positive pressure. You're bringing back more air than you're, than you're uh, returning. You're going to create a balloon in the house, and the house is not a balloon. It's not going to expand to take the additional pressure, so it's going to leak out through the cracks, around the windows, doors, whatever openings there are in the building. Three, what are some of the drivers that can create a negative pressure within a building? Duct system? Just talked about that. Central vacuum system? Chimneys and exhaust fans? All of the above. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all, that should be a gimme. They're all openings in the building. All these things are. This creates flow through the openings. That's an opening and that's an opening. Definitely going to create that pressure in the building. For combustion to occur, what three elements are necessary? Oxygen, fuel, and heat. A source, a flame, and a material. Air, gas, and wood. Earth, wind, and fire. I'm sorry, I couldn't avoid that. That's I just got, you know, I, I know, bad joke. Anyway, what, what, what do you need? Well, you got to have oxygen, you got to have fuel, and you got to have heat. And if you don't have these two and something to ignite it, you're not going to have a fire. The process of combustion is a mechanical process. An atomic distortion, that might be close to true, a conversion of light to heat, a chemical reaction. That's clearly a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction. It might be an atomic distortion, but I, I don't really think so. I don't really think that's true. And certainly this is the kind of, if you can make an argument for that, fine. But what I want to teach you here is find the best answer. And that's the best answer here because it's clear and unequivocal. Yeah, you might have a way of arguing the other one, but if you see something clear and unequivocal, no question about it, that's the answer. That's what they're looking for. All right, They want you to be able to pick that out of four things, and, and you should be able to. Why are humidifiers commonly used along with furnaces and the heat pumps during the heating season? Why do you typically see that? 
Uh, they do to improve comfort within the occupied space by decreasing the moisture content of the air. B, to improve the comfort within the occupied space by increasing the moisture content of the air. C, to raise the percent of relative humidity. D, to increase the evaporative effect during the heating season. Why do you install humidifiers? Well, you're trying to <laughs> you're trying to increase the moisture content of the air. You're not necessarily raising it, okay? You're not raising it. If you started out at 30 percent, you're maintaining 30 percent. You wouldn't want to go any higher, all right? But you you know this is an arguable arguable answer, but only arguable, not definitive. This is clearly definitive, all right? Learn to distinguish. You're going to see a lot of questions like this in the test. At least I do. I don't know, maybe because I like to argue. Seven, which has the greater capacity to hold moisture? Cold air, hot air, room temperature air, any temperature air. Yeah, hot air, sure. And it's relative. How hot is hot? Well, I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter. If it's hotter than a cold air, its capacity at any temperature is greater than its capacity when it's cooler to hold moisture. When you heat air up, it, its density decreases, its volume increases. So you have essentially more stuff to attach to. The molecules are further apart, uh, you know, so on and so forth. The greater the difference in temperature between a wet bulb and dry bulb, the higher the relative humidity, the lower the relative humidity, the greater the density, the greater the volume. Which is it? The greater the difference in temperature, the lower the relative humidity. Think of it this way. Remember, uh, what you're trying when you lower the wet bulb temperature, what you're doing is evaporating the moisture on that wick. So if the air is dry enough to can evaporate a lot of moisture from the wick, then its temperature is going to drop lower. All right. If the air is already 100% saturated, then you whirl that thing around, nothing's going to change. It can't, the, the air is already 100% saturated. It can't absorb moisture off that wick. So therefore, the relative humidity would be extremely high. And this is just the opposite case, right, where, where it's low because of that. Nine, a dry bulb temperature can be read off of a common room thermometer. B, is the standard by which most customers rate the heating and cooling system in their homes. C. Can only be accurately determined in laboratory settings with the proper equipment. D. Both A and B. Okay, where are we on this one? Yeah, man, these two. People will tell you, uh, you know, you've heard it, I've heard it. Boy, the other heating system we had in the old house. Man, I had to open the windows in the wintertime. I had so much heat in there. That was a great heating system. That was the worst piece of junk ever invented or installed. But customers don't see it that way. We could make it so cold in the other house that you could hang meat in the living room. It was so cold, you know. <laughs> Overkill is not good, not in the days of energy conservation. But people still see it the other way. Point here is your customer will see it that way. Ten, what are the basic essentials of human comfort? Heating in the winter, cooling in the summer, temperature, relative humidity, and air velocity. D, a good cigar with a glass of wine. Sorry, I, that, uh, I'm, I'm for D. I don't care. Go to D. All right, it's the only correct thing. Got to be a good cigar, and it's got to be any damn glass of wine. Um... Yeah, obviously, and this is a gimme. Temperature, relative humidity, and air velocity. Temperature, dampness, how fast is the air moving? Dampness or dryness, that's what relative humidity represents. A joist is A, a vertical structural member, B, a horizontal structural member, C, a diagonal structural member, or D, a sheathing material. What's a joist? Yeah, it's horizontal. Floor joist, ceiling joist, okay? A stud is 
A, a vertical structural member. B, same options, a horizontal structural member. C, a diagonal structural member or a sheathing material. What's a stud? I know, I'm a stud. That's what you're saying over there. Well, it takes a real stud to build a house. A, it's vertical, up and down. Okay. A stud, we like studs here, A, attaches to the top plate and to the sole plate. B, is typically placed on 16-inch centers in residential construction. C, is commonly used in a crawl space to support a girder. Or D, both A and B. What is a stud used for? Yeah, A and B. Attaches to the top and bottom plate. It's a vertical member and typically placed 16 inches on center in most codes. I think CABO is the exception where you can go to 24-inch centers. But all the most of the codes is 16 inches on center. 14, the material that covers the weather side of the rafters, that's the side that faces the weather, the outside, is what? Well, what's that? Siding? Is it gypsum sheetrock? Is it sheathing? Is it uh, any of the above? Well, what is it that you put outside on top of a rafter or the weather side of the rafter? Sheathing, yeah, typically. All right. Fifteen, a pier and beam foundation will be used for a house built over a crawl space, a house built on a concrete slab, a house built over a basement, both A and B. Where do you see pier and beam construction? Where do you see that? Yeah, it's crawl space. You're typically not going to see that, and although you do see it from time to time, but that is exceedingly rare, and it's usually when, because the, the base is too large, takes up too much room, but that's usually after you've had structural problems and the, it, the uh, girder or whatever in the basement is being reinforced. Okay. 16. A differential pressure gauge can A. Read differential pressure. I would hope so. B. Read a pressure relative to the atmosphere. C. Read direct absolute pressure differential. All right. Direct absolute differential pressure. Or B. Both A and B. What can it do? Yeah, it's both A and B. Differential or pressures relative to atmosphere. Hopefully we've discussed that to death. Because when you get the exam, if you're not prepared for this, if you haven't taken a preparation, these phrases are going to be meaningless to you. And that's why guys fail this exam. Uh, girls fail this exam. They don't take the time to prepare because they might be the best mechanics in the world. But they don't use, we don't talk like this. I don't say to you on the telephone, hey, go get me a differential pressure across that evaporator coil. I'll say, take the pressure drop over the evap or over the coil. You know, that's it. it it's uh, our jargon. All right, we don't get into the technical term. And then if I tell you, just tell me what the high side pressure is. Well, you know that that's you're just going to put your high side gauge in or your high side port connected. The other port's going to be the atmosphere. That is a pressure relative to atmosphere. But you don't talk like that. You tell me, oh, my high side pressure is uh, 0.40. I know what you did because we work together, you know. But you gotta, you got to think differently. This is academic by nature. 17, the tool necessary to determine proper evacuation of a refrigeration system is a micron gauge, a manifold gauge set, a compound gauge, both B and C. Well, most guys would go with B and C, but... You, you can't know the pressure in a system under evacuation without a micron gauge. You're just guessing at it. And you do one of two things in this industry, guys. You guess at it or you measure it. Get the gauge, measure it properly. Don't look at a piece of wood and say, ah, you know, i got to put this last piece of molding and it's got to fit between this point and that point. You're not going to guess at the length of that piece. You're going to take the ruler out and measure it. You're not going to look at a duct system and try to guess what the pressure is inside of it, although some of us think we can do that. You're going to take a magnahelic, a manometer, whatever out, and measure it. Think in those terms, if you want to get through this exam at least. 18, 14.7 PSIA is equal to 
14.7 PSIG, 3.14 PSIG, 1.73 PSIG, or 0 PSIG. What is 14.7 pounds absolute equal to in gauge pressure? Zero. Yeah, that's 14.7 is the weight of the atmosphere above sea level. When you're in Denver, Colorado, a mile high, this pressure is less. Because you're a mile further up, you've eliminated a mile of air pressure above you. Now there's not 120 miles of air pressure above you, there's 119. 19. 7 is what percentage of 9? What part of 9? What is this? 7 ninths, right? Pi is now 9 parts total, 9 equal parts. Take 7 away, what do you got in your hand? You got 7 ninths of that pi, all right? So what percentage is that? 55.55, 66.66%, or 88.88? What is it? How do you figure it? Well, 7 divided by 9, because it's 7 ninths, is 0.777 times 100 is 77.77. Just remember the process. Because you're going to get a question very similar to that in the exam. You've got to be able to answer it. And don't say, oh, I'm not good at math. I'm just going to blow off all the math questions. You're going to fail the exam if you do that. I can almost guarantee you. Because you're going to have five or six on there that are going to be math questions, four to six, somewhere in that range. So let's say you're taking a 50 exam. Take a 100 exam question, and you got six questions on there to the math. You can get 30 wrong. Well, now you can only get 24 wrong. Oh, wait a minute. You're not perfect, so 10% is going to be off anyway. That's another 10 questions, okay? Uh, you, you, there, there's going to be questions on there you're going to answer correct, they're going to count as wrong because you disagree on what's the most important thing. How often is that going to happen? One or two percent of the time. You're running out of places to go. Don't give up the math questions. This math is simple. If you can't do this math, it's only because you haven't worked at it. Sit down while you're watching Monday Night Football. Sit there with a uh, calculator in your hand and do, do ratios. So uh, 15, 64. What are you going to do? You're going to divide 64 into 15. And then you're going to multiply that by 100. It's that simple. And if you keep doing it and doing it, a chimpanzee could do it. I could teach an orangutan how to do that. You're a heck of a lot smarter than that. So stay with the program. Don't give up on the math questions. And besides that, that's a necessary, necessary requirement in this industry for you to be able to do that basic kind of mathematics. And it's becoming, with a high efficiency, high technology we're dealing with now in equipment, it's becoming even more and more important. What is the sum of the angles of a right triangle? What is the sum? What's the total? Sum is another word for total of the angles of a right triangle. Ninety? Degrees, 180 degrees, 270, 360. Well, I just did a circle on 90 degree increments. But what's the total of those angles? That's 180. Yeah, they have to add up to 180. Hopefully, we will see you in the next part, part two, where we'll take on different aspects of what you can expect to see on this core exam.